The thoughts and opinions expressed on Halal Money Matters do not necessarily reflect the views of Saturna Capital, Amana Mutual Funds, or their affiliates. Welcome to Halal Money Matters, presented by Saturna Capital. I'm Scott St. Clair. I'm Monim Salam. And Scott, we have a really great show today um, talking about um, the charitable sector. Yeah, I'm really excited to get in sort of where this money goes after we've invested it, we've gotten the returns. What do we do with it after that? So a lot of people sometimes don't know exactly where the money's going. And so um, I'm really excited to uh, speak to Anwar Khan today. He is president of Islamic Relief USA and actually one of the co-founders of Islamic Relief USA back in the 1993. So he's been there a long time, really knows the subject well and I'm ready to get into and find out where my $100 goes every time I donate. I'm excited to learn about it as well. Let's get into it. Uh, Anwar, thanks for joining us on the call. I'm really excited about this topic. It's been on my mind for a long time. Partly it's because I've been in the sector for a while as a volunteer. In fact, you know, pretty much my whole uh, professional career, I've been, I've been doing something along the lines of uh, charitable work and, and those type of things. So it's nice to be able to have you on this podcast. Thank you for having me. Charity is a very big part of Islam. And when you look at how we calculate, even when it comes to zakat, for example, you know, there's specific calculations on how you do it. Not only about the calculation part that's up to the individual, but there's also there's particular prescriptions in the Quran about who you actually give it to, right? So that's pretty specific. A long time ago, maybe it was something where people gave it on their own. But now there are organizations, charitable organizations that can deliver aid near and far, and arguably, maybe much more effective than other places. But maybe we can just start off and just talk a little bit about your history, Anwar, about you know how you got started, how Islamic Relief came about. Islamic Relief started by students from the University of Birmingham in 1984 in England. And the name of that organization is Islamic Relief Worldwide. It was as a result of the famine in East Africa in 1984. In America, we started in 1993. I'm one of the co-founders of Islamic Relief USA. So I was um, 13 years old when Islamic Relief started in Birmingham, England. In, in 1990, I went to the um, University of Birmingham. And I was a volunteer from the age of 18 from 1989 in high school. And I was excited, Monem and Scott that I wanted to do something that put something back in the year after I graduated. But there were no proper Islamic internship programs or um, organizations that I could go to to put something back in in the UK. And I thought that it was important when people were dying, we saw them on TV screaming to death in Bosnia that we needed to respond. So Islamic Relief USA started in 1993, and it was part of the family of Islamic Relief worldwide. So now we have 40 Islamic reliefs using that name around the world. It started by fundraising for emergencies. It then developed into not just doing a fundraising, it developed into actually doing the programs. That was the second stage. And the third stage is advocacy. So in Islamic Relief USA, we are involved in fundraising. That's one bucket. That's no money, no mission. The second bucket is doing the work and doing it well, inshallah. Um, no mission, no mission. And the third is advocacy, being witness to the mission. That's a good start because I, I know, you know, basically after graduating from college uh, in, in Birmingham, uh, and where you basically were given the task of coming as, at a young age just to America and you were kind of flying blind, right? Oh, not kind of completely flying blind. Uh, our strategy was Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, and I remember when someone asked us our strategy objective, we said Surah Al Mon, and we got told off, "Don't be ridiculous." But we came with that sincerity. We didn't know what KPIs were. We didn't know what ROIs were. We didn't know what um, that was at that stage. Because remember, we were grassroots activists who were involved in youth work in England. All we knew is hungry people. We need to raise money to help them. Now, alhamdulillah, we've become more sophisticated over time. But when people say to me, Monem, well, Islamic Khalif should work with young people. I said, what do you think I was 30 years ago? Yeah. So I was 22 years old. And our volunteers, mashallah, were as young as five, six years old. 
And I think I met you in 94, 95, um, when I'm, as a volunteer. Mm-hmm. You remember, we were about trying to make the world a better place, to summarize it. And we didn't always know the best way, but I think we had a humility that we didn't always know, and we were eager to learn. And more, you said something about no mission, no mission. What do you mean by that? No mission, no mission. There's no work. No, there's a reason why I said that. Because quite a few organizations that we believe are relief organizations in the U.S. are basically raising money and giving it to someone else. And those organizations will have very low overhead. So if I'm not doing much work and I'm just taking money from you and I'm giving that money to Scott to give to somebody else, then I'm not going to have to have really good accountants, lawyers, to make sure that that money goes overseas because I'm not really sending it overseas. I'm keeping it here and someone else is doing it. So what I'm actually doing is I'm claiming a lower overhead, but I'm giving that overhead to someone else, reducing transparency. So I will tell you I have a really low overhead, but you don't really know what the overhead is because I gave it to um, someone else, Scott. Now Scott's got his own overhead and it may be double, triple what I'm claiming but you won't know that. Okay, so this is a really good point for us to get a little bit more deeper into because it ties back to something you said, which is that you have 40 offices worldwide, right? 40 countries. 40 countries worldwide. So what that means is that there are independent organizations in those countries that are using the Islamic Relief name. Is that the right way to understand it? Well, USA is an independent, quite a few are independent, but um, Pakistan, South Sudan, and others are linked with um, UK. Okay. But I would say that there's 40 different organizations that okay. are registered in their respective countries. Some of them are completely independent. Some of them are dependent on IRW from the UK as an INGO. But all of them are part of a family. So that the family is, is, is tied together by name, basically. Just by name. mission. Yeah, not just mission. There's actually a license agreement between them. And so, for example, if I want to work in Pakistan, I can't just help Scott's uncle in Pakistan. I have to give money to Islamic Republic Pakistan. And Islamic Republic Pakistan will contact me and say, hey, IRUSA, there's a need on the ground. This isn't about me sitting and getting excited by an article on CNN or Al Jazeera and saying, okay, I need to send money to Pakistan. Pakistan will say, look, we've done a needs assessment. We need to have our concept note. This is the money we need. This is where we're going to work. And our job is to fund projects that we believe align with our mission. We believe that we have the funding for. Now, sometimes we're going to fund projects that we may not have the funding for, but we think are really important. And that's why the general fund is really important. So now, you know, I want to give money, say like a thousand dollars to Islamic Relief, right? And I specifically say, Hey, you know what? I heard that something's going on in Pakistan. I really want to give it for for that. So then I'm going to give you the money. You're going to receive it. And your responsibility is to be able to what? What happens to the money after it comes in? So it depends. If it's general money, it depends. If it's zakah money, it's more specific. If I can, I'll start with the zakah. According to our zakah policy, we will be spending 10% on admin here in the U.S., 2% 2% will be support work in internationally and 8% in the field. What does that mean? Here in the US, we will be spending money on raising that money. That's the general administration. That would be 10% we'll spend over here. So um, out of the $1,000, right? Um, $100 will go towards uh, raising more money. It will go towards raising money in the US, paying for the lawyers to make sure we don't go to jail. Because 25 Muslim organizations got shut down after 9-11. People are in jail because they fed hungry kids. There's a law in America that was part of the Patriot Act. It was the material support law. You can go to jail in America for feeding hungry kids if our US government doesn't like the relatives of those hungry kids. So this Mm -hmm. is really serious. So if we are dealing with large organizations, do you have lawyers? If you don't have lawyers, how are you making sure that this money is being able to be transferred legally? Do you have CPAs? Do you have accountants that know how to deal with banks? There are many Muslim organizations whose bank accounts have been shut down. You know this, Monim, in America. There are many Muslim individuals. This is a civil rights issue. I can discriminate against Muslims and shut down their bank accounts and... If you want us to make sure our bank accounts are open, 
we need to have quality accountants. Now, if I'm a little organization and I'm only raising $500,000, nobody's going to really worry about me. But when I'm raising $130 million, like I am in Islamic Relief USA, I'm going to be under more attack. And it is foolish for us to not have enough lawyers, enough accountants, enough professional staff to not only raise the money, money, to manage the money, and to make sure that the money is spent on the right projects in the right way. The entire uh, operations of the U.S., whether it be from you know raising more money to making sure that your dollar gets to the right hands, following up on that dollar to make sure that that, uh, that was it was spent properly, all of those things are being done within those ten percent. Yes, that includes our monitoring evaluation. That includes our auditing. That includes our accounts. Our work over here including Mm. administration, raising money, including even advocacy work. We're specifically here talking about Islamic Relief and at 10%, there might be a lot of different other charities. The bucket is overhead costs that we're talking about. Then there was another one that you mentioned with something about 2% for Islamic Relief. What was that? So that would be working through our international partner, IRW. They are providing additional M&E, additional audit to make sure that the money is being spent. That's not going towards fundraising. That's programmatic cost. And then there's an additional 8% in the field. So, for okay. example, I'm sending money to Pakistan for Sakar. 10% will keep here for our expenses here. 2% from IRW to make sure that the money is being spent from their side. And 8% in Pakistan to help pay for the running cost of the office and the programmatic work that they do. So basically, then I, I can understand the 8% cost, which is, you know, um, having an office there, having staff be able to distribute, you know, the trucks that you need to be able to um, yeah. move the supplies, gasoline, the supply chain, basically, that's there. And I can understand from the perspective of the US, which is the 10% and going into the legal costs and those type of things, hiring people like you to go out there and spread the word and, uh, and do, do those things as well. I'm a little confused about the 2%, however, where, where does that bridge come in? Okay. So that is for the lawyers, for the accountants in the International Secretariat in Birmingham, England. They're the ones that manage the general license. They're the ones that manage the trademark. They're the ones that speak at international conferences on our behalf who do the advocacy work. They're the ones that keep an eye on the 8% from Pakistan. But technically, you could actually send the money directly to Pakistan? I could send it there, but I would not have the experience. I wouldn't have the check and balances. I wouldn't have the financial and legal rigor. Um, I'd be missing that out from the IRW. So they're basically like an extra set of eyes. And they have programmatic experience. That includes all of our best programs people from IRW. They're the ones that get the request from Pakistan. Then they look at it. Then they adapt it. Then they send it to USA. So we've got not just an extra pair of eyes to make sure that it's managed properly, but we've got experience of people who have done the programs and who can manage the programs. Right. So programs would be, for example, running a school or uh, it would be distribution of food. So we would make sure that we have child protection team in IRW that makes sure that those programs aren't hurting the children. We have education specialists, we have nutrition specialists, we have Islamic finance specialists with PhDs who are based out of IRW, who make sure that these programs are in alignment with our mission in the best way possible. And then we will work with the local office, let's say Pakistan, we picked that as an example, yeah, to make sure that the schools are in line with our child safety policy, in alignment with our education policy and so on. Um, so 20% of that sounds like is going to, at least in the U.S. here, a lot of like administrative work, the lawyers, like you said, that it's really important to keep the rest of the money doing the work that it does, right? Yeah, so 10%, you can say, is on general administration in the U.S., okay. a little bit of programs, and 10% on programmatic support overseas. So this is only for zakat, right? This is for zakat, yeah. Now, if we're dealing in non-zakat, then it depends what kind of program we're doing. Do you find there's a competition amongst different charitable organizations to reduce this number, or it's pretty much all the same 20% is is what it is? We are one of the few organizations that actually have a written zakat policy. And because of that, uh, it's easier to attack us because we have more transparency. Many times people say, oh, this is zakat eligible. Really? 
What's the name of the scholars? Where's your zakah policy? So we have a zakah policy. We've named the scholars on the zakah policy. It took us one year to come out with the latest um, iteration of the zakah policy. You can disagree with what we're saying, and that's allowed in Islam, yeah? Mm. But we have the evidence. This is not something that I came up with with my friends. We have eminent scholars in the US who understand fiqh, who understand relief, who understand zakah. We explained to them all of the um, issues we're facing. So we came up with this zakah policy. Mm. So people will tell you, oh, I have a percentage admin of, let's say, 3% or 4%. How did you calculate that? So our calculation is based on what we saw on our 990, and it's what we give to the IRS. So overall, Islamic belief in the USA, overall, we're normally going between 16 to 18%. We're bouncing around that number, okay? And this is according to the IRS, the amount of money we keep, and then we send the money overseas or we give it to partners, or we spend it locally. The zakah number I gave you is going even more deeper. It's not just saying how much we keep, it's also saying how much is spent on programmatic work. Now, according to the IRS, programmatic work is work. So it would be included according to the IRS on the actual program's work. So the way we did zakah is much more conservative. According to the IRS, the programmatic work we would be doing, they would regard that overseas as programmatic work. According to our scholars, they said, no, um, call it programmatic support. Okay, I think you lost me on the programmatic work. The normal way of working, which the IRS would count, it would be 10%, not 20%. Okay, so so a lot of extra costs are folded in there. So the programmatic support that we're doing is counted in our industry as programmatic work. It's not fundraising. It's not for legal. It's not for other stuff. Programmatic support would be included not as admin, it would be included as programmatic work. There's different definitions between the IRS and the scholars. There's the IRS definition, and then there's the Zakar definition. The Zakar definition is more conservative. Just to be clear on what you mean by programmatic work, person who's directly involved with the distribution of the aid, for example, Yes. and that's considered programmatic work. Yes. A person who's actually raising money, that's called admin work. Exactly. The accounting is admin. So it, there's fundraising and admin would normally be counted as administration expense. And then so the rest of the money, which is the non-programmatic and, and admin on the zakat side, so let's say 80% roughly, that is actually going towards the, the, the people that we need it the most that are specifically stated in the Quran to be re- recipients of zakat. Yes. So that helps. Now, so for every $100 that I give Islamic Qadif, I could expect that about $80 is going to go there. 80 out of $100 go in the hand, 10 will go to people to help to administer that, to make sure that it's given in the proper way. We'll go to help the people and 10% will continue our work in the US. And then what about the non zakat part of it? So with the non zakat, when I'm doing long-term development work, that's more expensive than if I'm just giving out food on the back of a truck. If I have to employ engineers to build water wells, that's going to be a more expensive project than if I'm just handing out water bottles. So the administration isn't a standard amount. When people say, but Anwar, if I give $100, it depends which country. It depends what administration is in that country. It depends the difficulty of working there. If I'm having to take it on the back of a donkey up a mountain, which literally we had to do, that's going to be different. Then if I'm putting it in a um, train and the train is speeding along. Overall, as an organization, if you get a million dollars, how much of that is going to what? So I think the individual thing, it depends on the kind of project you're doing. But overall, as an organization, if you look at our 990 and so on, overall, we're about 16 to 18%. I could make that percentage lower if I was less conservative in the way that I do the calculation. And this is all legal. I could, for example, add more gifting kind. I could get gifts of medicine and I could use that gifting kind medicine and lower the percentage admin. We used to be lower because we had gifting kind. So I can make the percentage admin lower, but we decided we're taking a more conservative approach the way that we do the calculation. We could just, for example, get a lot of cheap medicine and we could lower our percentage admin down. That makes sense. So what specifically is a gift in kind in terms of like a charitable organization? So gift in kind, for example, is if somebody gives you 
blankets. They may be used, they may be brand new. Someone gives you medicine. Because we're getting really technical now. So I want to be clear. What I'm saying, this is all legal. But within things being legal, there's questions about whether it's the right thing to do. If, for example, you give me brand new coats, I value those coats at $100 in America. I can then send those coats overseas. They'll get to, let's say, Pakistan. Pakistan will charge tax on them. I can say that I got the coat for free, but you paid $100. Yeah? I didn't send it over there. But there's customs and duty, there's shipping cost, and there's distribution cost. I can actually buy that coat, let's say in Pakistan, for $30. But I've now spent more than $30, but I can say I got a donation of $100 from you. So on my books, I can say I got $100. Now, are we going to value it at what the coat is worth in America? Or are we going to value what it can cost in the country where we're sending it? We've decided in the last few years to move away from sending what we call gifts in kind donated items. And we'd rather buy the items locally to support the local industry. I know sometimes you send over hospital beds. Some people do that gifts in kind. And sometimes they're doing hundreds of hospital beds to, I don't know, let's pick up country, a war zone country like Yemen. Now, let's be realistic. You can't buy hospital beds in Yemen hundreds of thousands at a time. Sometimes you do have to do the GIK in country, right? We actually have done that. In that particular case, we'll take the hospital beds. So it does become depend on supply of whatever's available in the country. Exactly. So I was saying that sometimes people are looking at GIK and they've got tens of millions of GIK. We're not looking at the amount of money. We're looking at the quality of the GIK. Sure. So mm-hmm. when the London Olympics happened in 2012, they had a lot of hospital beds just in case they, they needed them. They never used them. They needed them to another organization. We worked with that other organization to send it to a country where they don't get hospital beds of that quality. So there's a difference between sending hospital beds and used blankets. I don't want your dirty used blanket. Please wash it and donate it to your local shelter here in America. So it's also a matter of what they call in Arabic, Iza, right? And people want to accept what's new. No, they don't want your trash. They want, they want your treasure. Exactly. So some people say, Gifts in kind, it's just trying to inflate the income that the charities get and they overvalue it. That's one extreme. There's another extreme saying, oh, we can't do work without gift in kind. It's the most important thing. It needs to be given. People are giving it to us out of love. We need to take it and send it there. No matter what the cost are, even if it's costing more to send it there, then it's actually worth. My approach is, Number one, do they need that item in the country? Two is, how much is that item worth in the country? Is it worth financially us getting that item for free in America, cleaning it, putting it on a cargo, sending it overseas, paying customs, delivering it there? And the answer is, sometimes, yes, it absolutely is. So if it's high-quality hospital beds, if it's medical equipment, absolutely. If it's old socks, if it's clothes or blankets, no. So we have actually have to make a calculation model. Is it worth us sending it there? And, you know, when we send medical equipment, before we do anything, Scott, we ask the country, this is the medical equipment we have. Does anybody want it? And certain countries say, yeah, we want this. So we found, for example, that in parts of Africa, they want certain kind of medication. In parts of Asia and Africa, they want certain medical equipment. Then we try to connect the medical equipment from the donor here with the people on the ground. So I know many times when it's been done successfully, we are not driven by what the value of it is and it's going to make our books look good. We're driven by what the need of it is on the ground. Could you explain how these gifting kinds could help you reduce your admin expense? So I'll give an example. Let's say the stuff you're giving me, you value it as $1 million in the US, but I might value it as $100,000 if I get it from India. Now, legally, I can book it as a million or I can book it as 100,000. If I book it as a million, my percentage admin goes down. If I book it at 100,000, then it won't go down as much. This was actually an example. There's medications that are worth a million here. They're worth 100,000 in India. 
if I get that from India for $100,000 and I send it by road, let's say, to Afghanistan, or I send it to somewhere in Asia, then my admin of that would be much less. So if someone donates it to me for 100000 over there, compared to if someone donates it for a million in America, because once I get it in America and I say it's a million, I'm going to have to pay tax on that million when it arrives in the end country. I'm going to have to pay for the shipping of that. I'm going to have to pay for the distribution. And sending it from America is more expensive than sourcing it locally. So Islamic Relief USA couldn't do a gift in kind from India. You'd have to do it from the US, right? Normally, it, I'm getting the donation in America. That's correct. Usually, I'm getting mm-hmm. the donation in America. Then I'm sending it overseas. But it sounds okay. like you, you try to, if you can, locally source it and just send money for America if possible. Exactly. Because that's more efficient. It's more efficient. You're helping the local economy. You're putting money into the local economy. And I'm worried that if you are sending too much supplies from America, then you're dumping food and dumping medicine and destroying the local market. And we've seen this happening in developing countries where a lot of food, a lot of medicine has destroyed the local market. So we always try, if we can, to buy the supplies or source them locally so we can support the local market. On the Uh, flip side of that, you have some kind of a relief that you're doing and you come in and buy $5 million worth of aid. You're going to be increasing the, the prices of the local goods for the people who normally could have afforded it, but now can't because you made the price go up. So it's a balance, money. But what we found, for example, in Pakistan, when the floods happened, we learned how to work with different organizations to buy tents locally. So we actually, Monem, we buy the tents in advance, we have them in storage, we have contracts with different providers, and those tents went to Philippines, those tents went to different countries around the world when they needed. So we actually found that it is better to buy some of these supplies in advance and to have contracts in advance because the price goes through the roof at that time. When I was in Pakistan after the earthquake and the price of the cloth that you use to wrap the dead bodies in the three white pieces of cloth, they said it went up a thousand percent. If you want to bring in the supplies from overseas, then yeah, you want to get those. But I don't want blankets. I want white funeral shrouds. And I don't want them on a slow ship that takes six months to get there. I need them on a cargo plane. And a cargo plane is very expensive. When I was talking to one of my colleagues uh, after Hurricane Haiyan, he said, Anwar, we need the tents. We need them. I said, okay, okay. I can get you the tents from Pakistan. But if you can wait six weeks, it will cost a fraction of if I rent a cargo plane, which will cost a lot more money. He said, Anwar, if you're going to put it on a cargo ship and it's going to take six weeks to get here, keep it We are right now dying out here. We're under the stars. We need the tents right now. Mm. I can't wait six weeks. I need them now. So we actually flew them in from Pakistan. We had staff on the ground in Philippines from America waiting. Because you know what happened when those supplies arrived sometimes? They get stolen or they get lost. Mm. So our guys were waiting on the tarmac When the plane arrived, we made sure that we got those from the plane. We then worked with a local Christian Filipino organization to get their trucks to move it from the airport to near the water. Then we got dinghies. I'm not making this stuff up. Dinghies with little uh, rowboats. And we put one tent on each one and we sent it to the most remote islands. Now, I can keep my percentage admin low by not doing any of that. I can send it by ship and I can get it when it's not needed. I can send it by truck or I can give it to a local army and then just say Bismillah and hopefully it gets there. Or I can trace it all the way with these guys in their dinghies going in rowboats to deliver it in the most remote island. And it costs more to deliver it to the people who need it the most than if you just dump it at the airport in Manila or in Cebu. Very technical now. Yeah, it is very technical, which is good. I mean, I think people need to understand the intricacies. There's a reason why you pay the 10%. There's a lot of intricacies and there's a lot of understanding that goes goes into it. 
I would rather pay 10% than lose everything for it to be stolen. I can pay 10% or I can pay 100%. Something I really want to tell you guys. This is a yeah. book, Islamic Charity by Samantha May. The title is How Charitable Giving Became Seen as a Threat to National Security. This book is talking about how much harassment Muslim charities get and how difficult it is for them to um, send the money. People have gone to jail because they've been accused of not making sure the money was spent properly. We were told very clearly, Scott, our job was not to raise the money at the lowest cost. It was to make sure that the money raised reaches the people who we actually delivered it to. That costs money and you want to have experts. Volunteers normally don't know the intricacies of how to do a 990. They don't know about all the different schedules that we have to do. They don't normally know as much as a chartered accountant. They don't know about child safety. We make sure, for example, that when there's an adult there, a child is not going to the toilet by themselves. We want to make sure that we reduce child abuse, that we reduce corruption in places where we're working. You notice that should reduce. All this money you're spending on is completely worth it to make the charity as effective as possible. How much is the child safety worth, Scott? Exactly. If I'm telling you my admin is 3%, and then I just ask a simple question, do you have child safety policy? Do you have child safety officers? Do you have m and &E? Ideally, one M, you get what you pay for. That's not always the case in life. So, for example, sure. if I want to buy a car, I can buy really cheap cars. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Or I can buy really expensive cars. Me, personally, I like the Toyota Camry because I trust Toyota. The Camry is bigger than a Corolla. And it's more safer for my family. Now, there's cheaper cars than a Camry, and there's much more expensive cars than a Camry. What's my priority? I want good value for money, and I want to protect my family, and I don't want the miles per gallon to be too high. When we look at a car, it's not a case of how much bang for my buck am I getting? No, you get what you pay for. At the end of the day, you want to get what you pay for. So if you want to pay for an agency, that is not just raising money, but is actually spending the money in the right way at the right time, is winning awards for the work that they're doing, is regarded as very transparent, and at the same time is doing advocacy work to help to prevent the problem happening in the first place, then you're going to pay more for someone who's just taking the money, giving it to someone else, and just forwarding the money onwards. So you get what you pay for. The same with a car. The same with uh, any yeah. product. No, that's, that's a good point. The one thing I want to highlight also, you kind of touched upon it, uh, and that is that um, you save like the tents and stuff like that. You have warehouses where you keep them. So then when the emergency happens, then you're able to deploy them, right? That kind of begs the question. When I see something on TV where there's an earthquake, you know, in Iran or in Turkey, the recent one that happened, and I'm giving one, you know, $100 to Islamic Kudis, you're not literally going out there and buying the tents right then and there to give them to them. You already have those tents, you're de delivering those, and you're replenishing the supply for any other emergency that happens. Well, yeah, in some places, that's what we do. So in Turkey, we're basically buying the supplies locally, Mona. In answer to your question, mm -hmm. there was plenty of supplies available. We were getting them locally. In other places like Philippines, they were like gold dust. So we were bringing them in from Pakistan. So it's not only about the local supply, right? It's all about deliver time delivery as well. If I give you $100 and you have to go out there and buy it, source it, do, deploy it, is different than saying I already have it in my warehouse, all I'm going so, to do is deploy it. So it's a, it's a time issue as well. Yeah. So to be frank with you, that was such a horrific crisis. Over 50,000 people died. Nobody's ready to respond to that at the level it needed. No government in the world is ready to take care of 50,000 people that died there. Or in the case of Pakistan, 80,000 in the earthquake or the huge number that died in Port-au-Prince. Look at here in America. We weren't ready for the 1,000 that died in Katrina. Those of you are old enough to remember, <laughs> there was a mess made of that. At the beginning of the crisis, it's often chaos. And if it's at that level, it's difficult to get the supplies. So we try to mitigate it with sending as much supplies as we can, as quickly as we can where they need it. People shouldn't imagine that large amounts of supplies are arriving in 24 hours. It's not the case. The money needs to be raised in the first few days and the first couple of weeks to be spent for the next few years.
In Turkey, you just don't need food and clean water and tents. You also need rehabilitation. You need to rebuild people's homes. There's so much that needs to be done. So when a crisis like that happens, it takes two to three years to actually help people to get back on their feet. It's not Mm -hmm. done in days, it's done in years. Relative to all the charitable organizations that are out there, how are Muslim organizations doing when it comes to overhead? You have to compare apples with apples. So if you're talking about organizations that don't have many staff overseas and basically are fundraising organizations, they have very low overhead. If you're talking about organizations that have professionals over here that know how to do the right programs and that have lawyers and that have proper processes and make sure that the money is spent overseas, I would say that we are lower than our industry standard. So Muslim organizations who are doing work at a higher quality level have slightly lower admin than the average uh, American nonprofit. And Muslim organizations that do not have much programmatic capacity, finance, legal capacity, they have very low overhead. They look like they're doing great. Yeah. So So like for like, I guess you're saying that the Muslim organizations are a little bit cheaper. Yeah, but I would argue that's also because we might not be able to offer all the same checks and balances. So if you'd asked me this question 25 years ago, Monim, I would have given you a different answer. With my maturity, with my experience, And Mela, forgive me for my arrogance when I was younger. I was like, so happy. Oh, our overhead is so low. That's great. Now I'm like, yeah, the overhead is low because we don't have child safety officers. We don't have the lawyers. I give example, your company, Saturna. Why do I need you and Scott? Why can't I just ask my uncle to invest the money? But when I'm working with Saturna, I'm going to ask you questions. I want to know how much money I'm making every year. Ask those questions to Islamic colleagues. Ask those questions to some other organizations and you might be surprised with the answers you get. I would rather that I tell people sometimes, hey, I don't know the answer to your question or, hey, it's not an easy question for me to answer rather than just come up with um, stuff. I remember years ago, nearly 30 years ago, someone asked a question and I just happened to be standing there. How are you getting the supplies into Iraq? Oh, we just fly them in. (laughs) And the person walked off because as you know, Monem, there was an embargo at that time, sanctions on Iraq. I had to run in there and say, no, no, please don't listen to him. No, sir. He's um, just a volunteer. <laughs> you were a volunteer when you went into Bosnia and visited the mass graves with me. Yeah. You were a volunteer when you and me were trying to avoid the bombs from the bombers in Chechnya. You were a volunteer when you went many times. So there are trained volunteers and then there are untrained volunteers. So I want to be clear. By the way, do you think volunteer work is free, Scott? Your volunteer needs to be trained, am I right? And needs to be managed. When we get volunteers to work with children, Scott, we have to pay money to do a criminal background check. When Mm. people come to our Islamic Relief childcare services at any event, people may not realize this morning. The childcare staff are certified with CPR. We used to pay a few hundred dollars for babysitting, it then went to a couple of thousand dollars for childcare. Mm -hmm. But we're now giving a quality product. I think this is a good example. In the past, we were getting aunties from the local masjid to put on Disney films and to give out pizza. Our overheads were much lower. Now we have people who are certified in CPR and who are coming like the mad scientists with the kids and doing the volcano eruption and making the kids want to come. Look, in the 80s, Our opinion in the sector, because you asked me about the sector, Mm -hmm. the sector was, hey, why are you asking so many questions? I'm doing you a favor. Give me food. There's 100 kids in Africa. We had all these children that were nearly naked, that had big bellies, and we were meant to feel bad. I would argue that that wasn't done ethically. I I don't like those images of starving Mm -hmm. children in Africa. But that's what we did to raise money in the 80s. We want to help. We have money. They should just be thankful for anything we're giving. That's a very patriarchal approach. That was in the 80s. Then later on, we said, no, we need more of a needs-based approach. Can we check with the people if they actually want the food? If they don't eat rice, why are we sending them rice? Mm -hmm. I remember, Scott, people were sending pork to Muslims in Sarajevo. Not a very effective piece of charity. And they said, this is not charity, this is an insult. I said, no, it's just stupidity. 
the knees brace is, does the person actually need it? Are we dumping the stuff in America because we have extra crops and we're just dumping it in Africa? Or do the people in Africa actually need that food at that particular time? Then there's the next approach that came up later. It's called rights-based approach, where we ask the people, how do you think you can have a better quality of life? Well, you know what? We don't want you to send food from America. We want you to help us to grow food locally. And we notice with climate change, the environment is more arid. So we want to rebuild our ancient irrigation systems that we have. As you can tell, it's not a hypothetical. This actually happened. And we want solar power panels. So we want to mix it between our ancient systems of preserving water and cutting edge solar power. So we did that. The rights-based approach is based on people's rights, not just their needs. And the original approach was, hey, just be happy. I'm giving you money. I'm such a nice guy. So my focus to your audience is, it's not about you. It's not about you having a glow and being happy. Hey, I'm such a nice person. Inshallah, you are a nice person. It's about how does my money help the person in need that no one else is helping? If you're going to give money on the top of that mountain, it's much more expensive than giving money at the airport. When you arrive, it's much more expensive than dumping it on the side of the street. Do I trust this organization? Do they have a track record of delivering the aid? And this is my question. You know, when people say to me, what's the percentage admin? You know, one number I think is important, 13. 13 of our staff have died in the last 20 years to deliver aid. 13. I believe, Munim, if my memory serves me right, you were with me when we went to meet Morat and his mother was crying. So the first time, Scott, I went to meet Morat, he picked me up at the airport in Russia. The second time I went to see him, he wasn't there. We went to his house. He died delivering the aid earlier. Monim was there with his mother and his mother said, I lost my son, but I have all of you from Islamic Relief as my children. Mm -hmm. And if you remember Monim, his widow was there and his baby was very young. He was a few months when his dad died. When we're thinking about halal money matters, can we think that people have died to deliver this aid? Can we realize that people are in jail right now trying to deliver aid? Can we realize that this isn't just a money issue? It's a civil rights issue. It's an emotional issue. At the center of the work we do, it's not about us feeling good and dumping money. It's about what Imam Ghazali said in his Mokasi. The center of our work has to be raising human dignity. So we're about raising human dignity. We're about giving hope. We're about that person crying, who's going to help me, Ya Allah? Who's going to help me? And inshallah, your supporters, your donors, our donors here in the US will be giving money to different Muslim organizations that will be replying people's calls. There's a cycle of love. God, you give us a donation. We then do admin, make sure that it goes to the right place. Our staff may risk their life to deliver that aid. Then that goes to the person in need. What does that person do? They raise their two hands and they pray that Allah benefits you. Then the barakah, the blessings from that person come to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is helping you. Now that cycle of love begins again. So please don't think of it as just it's a transactional thing. This is a transcendental thing that we're doing. That's a good wrap up for our discussion. I know we sometimes do focus on the money and the numbers because we're a Halal Money Matters podcast. If I have fitna and I do things in the wrong way, but I'm more efficient, is that more important than I do the right thing in the right way and my ad is a bit higher? Was that useful? Yeah. Thanks, Anwar. That was great. Thank you. Please consider an investment's objectives, risks, charges, and expenses carefully before investing. To obtain this and other important information about the Amana Funds in a current prospectus or summary prospectus, please visit amanafunds.com or call toll-free 1-800-728-8762. Please read the prospectus or summary prospectus carefully before investing. The Amana Funds are distributed by Saturna Brokerage Services, member FINRA and SIPC, and a wholly owned subsidiary of Saturna Capital, the investment advisor to the Amana Funds. 
Investing involves risk, including the risk that you could lose money. The Amana funds restrict investments to those companies consistent with Islamic and sustainable principles, which limits opportunities and may affect performance. This material is for general information only and is not a research report or commentary on any investment products offered by Saturna Capital. This material should not be construed as an offer to sell or the solicitation of an offer to buy any security in any jurisdiction where such an offer or solicitation would be illegal. We do not provide tax accounting or legal advice to our clients and all investors are advised to consult with their tax, accounting, or legal advisors regarding any potential investment. Investors should not assume that investments in the securities and or sectors described were or will be profitable. This podcast is prepared based on information Saturna Capital deems reliable. However, Saturna Capital does not warrant the accuracy or completeness of the information. Investors should consult with a financial advisor prior to making an investment decision. The views and information discussed in this commentary are at a specific point in time, are subject to change, and may not reflect the views of the firm as a whole. All material presented in this publication, unless specifically indicated otherwise, is under copyright to Saturna. No part of this publication may be altered in any way copied or distributed without the prior express written permission of Saturna Capital.